Hello, and welcome back. Today, we're looking at Shakespeare After All by Marjorie Garber. But first, just so you know, if you are interested, right after we do the review, we're going to be looking at some basic facts about Shakespeare. So if you're interested in that, stay afterwards. First, let's just jump into why we're here. And it's going to be Shakespeare After All by Marjorie Garber. Garber does a compelling job here. Uh, and this book is a wonderful companion for any Shakespearean. Garber gives wonderful insights into all 38 of the Bard's plays with vigor and sharp analysis. Her prose is clean, engaging, and comprehensible. She also gives a great introduction to Shakespeare's life and times. If you're new to the world of Shakespeare, or if you're a Shakespearean scholar, this book is for you. Also, if you are currently an English major for some odd reason, and you're an undergrad or even a grad student, then this is a great book for you. I know that if you are a Shakespearean, you are familiar with the world-renowned Shakespearean scholar, Stephen Greenblatt. Great, great writer when it comes to Shakespeare and everything. Uh, but you know what? Marjorie Garber does a great job here too. And I think, in my opinion, she does a wonderful job of bringing Shakespeare's plays in a more accessible language. So she definitely interprets, analyzes, and gives you all of the great nitty gritty of Shakespeare's plays. And the best part is you understand it. <laughs> so definitely do yourself a favor, grab Shakespeare after all, if you're interested in Shakespeare's plays. If you want to get a deeper and richer understanding of Shakespeare's plays, check out Marjorie Garber's book. It is wonderful. All right. So if you're interested in a little bit of Shakespeare, some basic facts in case you don't know anything about Shakespeare, uh, he was married to a woman by the name of Anne Hathaway, not the actress of today, but another woman by the name of Anne Hathaway during Shakespeare's time. And there's a lot of controversy going on with that because with Anne Hathaway, there was it was said that Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway kind of got it on, and you know, lo and behold, she became pregnant. Now, what happened was Shakespeare was about 18 at the time, and I believe Anne Hathaway was about 26 or so. So she was very much, she was older. And this was strange because during this time period, it would be the other way around. It was common for the man to be much older than the woman. But in this case, Anne Hathaway was much older. Now, there's a lot of rumors here that Shakespeare was forced into this marriage by Anne Hathaway's family, which would make sense since a woman at this time period could not be seen as a single mother, so to speak. Uh, again, the time period. Now, based off that, Shakespeare did have a lot of children, or a few children, rather, with Anne Hathaway, and one of them being Hamnet. Now, Hamnet is also basically the name of Hamlet. Hamlet and Hamnet were interchangeable. So what's interesting here is that Hamnet died at 11 years old to, due to the plague. Now, it's a sad and tragic tale, but there's not much going on with Hamlet. It's almost as though he gets skipped. And there's also a question here that's raised is, is Hamlet based off Hamnet, Shakespeare's son? Now, there is a great novel by Maggie O'Farrell called Hamnet, which chronicles Hamnet and his life. So if anyone's interested in that, this is a, another great novel here based off Shakespeare's life, Hamnet, and we get to learn about his son. Again, very great book, very well written. So check that out if anyone's was interested. Also, Gillian Flynn, the author of Gone Girl, she should be coming up with a new adaptation of Hamlet. So uh, that's something to look forward to. It should come out this year, I believe. If not, I'll keep you guys posted. But it should be pretty interesting in the way that only Gillian Flynn can do it. So Shakespeare, at the time of his death, left his wife his second favorite mattress. That, now, that seems interesting. His second favorite mattress. Uh, why is that? <laughs> well, that's a strange thing for the you know for a poet of love here to leave his wife his second favorite mattress. Just so you guys know, quick uh, medieval lesson. During this time period, if you had a bed, that meant you had money, right? So what you would do is you would show that off. So when people came into the living room, they would see a bed, and that bed would just be for display. There would be a second bed somewhere in a room, uh, again, nothing as nice as that first mattress, but this would be the common mattress that was used to sleep in, right? So this is uh, what Shakespeare left his second wife, his favorite mattress, his second favorite mattress, probably because, you know, they shared that bed. Now, Shakespeare didn't just sit and write his plays. He wrote them as they were performed, right? So it wasn't like Shakespeare f sat down at his desk and said, you know what? I have a great idea for a love story. I'm going to make Romeo and Juliet, right? And then he writes that out. It's not, that's not the way it went down. 
he would actually be at the play at the theater and he would be writing the play as the actors were performing it. So he would be coming up with the lines pretty much on the spot and starts to and write writes those lines for and gives them to the actors to perform. Of course, they would constantly tell him and say, listen, Will, you got to change this up, uh, make it more dramatic here, right? So he would do that. And, you know, it was pretty much like writing as you go, so to speak. And the final thing I'm going to say is he had many haters, right? Uh, Shakespeare didn't have what you would call a classic education like the other writers at the time. Uh, other writers had a classic education, uh, and which basically meant they went to university. Shakespeare only had a grammar school level education, but the grammar school level education then was way, way more advanced than the grammar school education of today. And because of this, his plays came out, they were all hits, it was hit after hit. And those other playwrights like Ben Johnson, who was the second greatest playwright, obviously the first greatest being Shakespeare, uh, they all hated him for it. And I think it was another another reason why it was that is because they were hits. But what Shakespeare really truly captured, in my opinion, that the other writers didn't was human psychology. Shakespeare just knew how people worked. All right, guys. So I won't take too much of your time. The last thing I'm going to say is, if you've never read Shakespeare, a good place to start, in my opinion, would be Romeo and Juliet. Everybody's familiar with this wonderful play, <laughs> this tragedy, this love tale, which is not really about love, as many would have you believe. So Romeo and Juliet's a lot deeper than you think. So start off with Romeo and Juliet. Don't think of it as a love play. Look deeper. What's Shakespeare really saying there? Hint, it's in the prologue. Uh, another thing, if you want to finish that, if you like Shakespeare, you want to continue it, good follow-up is A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is Shakespeare's only original play. All the other plays are based off works from the past or works from the book that he was looking at when he was reading this. But Summer Night's Dream was totally Shakespeare's imagination. All right, guys, so that's it for today. We'll come back and do another review next time. Catch you later.